Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, February 5th, 2015. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Chris Colby, editor of BeerAndWineJournal.com, and I revisit a topic that we haven't talked about since 2009, partial mashing. Is this hybrid of all grain and extract just a stepping stone? Or are there benefits that we can realize by blending the two techniques? If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. Our show page on Facebook is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on the Google Plus as well. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. You know how it works. Whenever you want to shop on Amazon, go to our website first, basicbrewing.com. Click on our Amazon ad there on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, And then you can shop at Amazon to your heart's content. It won't cost you any extra, but you'll be helping us to bring you this show. So we greatly appreciate your support there. We have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes and our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. Thanks to everybody who's done so already. We got to lot. Uh, we have a lot to talk about this week, so let's jump right in. We're just uh, we'll look take a look into the mailbag. Adam from uh, the Bay Area, California, writes: uh, I really enjoyed the Creek Brewing episode. One thing that made me pause a bit was the use of cherry pits in the beer. Cherry pits and apricot pits contain a small amount of amygdalin, which isn't dangerous directly, but with certain enzymes can be broken down into cyanide. Yes, that cyanide of spy movie fame. Does Dr. Lambic know anything about this, or is he concerned about it? And how about you? Well, I I wasn't concerned about it until this letter. (laughs) So I forwarded it to uh, uh, Matt Miller, otherwise known as Dr. Lambic, who was on our show talking about brewing creeks or uh, cherry lambics. Matt says, uh, the simplest answer to the question of cyanide danger from cherry pits would be that because this process, i.e. soaking whole cherries, including the pits, in lambic beer, must not extract a toxic level of cyanide from cherry seeds because this same process has been done historically in Belgium for at least 100 years without incident. There are two or three potential reasons for this. Number one, there may not be enough amygdalin extracted by the process to pose a threat. Number two, The pH of lambic beer may prevent the enzymes required to free hydrogen cyanide from amygdalin uh, from functioning. And number three, hydrogen cyanide is a fairly volatile chemical, and it may off-gas from the beer at a rate equal to or above the rate at which it is released from the seeds. Matt says, I have no idea which, if any of these mechanisms may be at play, but I'm confident that there is no significant risk of using whole cherries and cherry pits in the process of making creeks simply because that's how some of the most popular and excellent Belgian creeks are made. And these products have never been linked to any toxicity. Uh, Matt says, awesome question. I wish I had some more definitive facts to give. I would definitely, uh, definitely say, though, that the process is safe as long as the traditional methods are maintained. I would not recommend crushing or otherwise altering the seeds, nor would I recommend trying to make any type of tincture uh, or extracts of their flavors. Anything that concentrates their chemical components may be dangerous. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Very interesting. Thanks to uh, Adam for the question and Matt for the answer. No making cyanide with your pits. Um... I believe we've got enough email about the brewing uh, software issue to put together a show, so uh, I appreciate everybody who has contributed. Lots of good info in those emails. And um, as often happens, this week's show was also triggered by an email message. Uh, Chris Colby, editor of BeerAndWineJournal.com, and I have talked about partial mashing a couple times in the past, uh, but it's a long time. It's time for an update Time for a revisit. 
Chris Colby. Welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. James, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, we are we are recovering from the uh, the the sting in our egos that Budweiser has uh, has uh, delivered over the Super Bowl uh, with the the fussy beer ad. Uh, <laughs> the Twitterverse we're recording on Tuesday. Uh, the Twitterverse is uh, is calmed down a bit uh, after that, but uh, boy. If uh, Budweiser wanted to, to garner some attention, they sure know how to do it, at least among the craft beer community. Yeah. Cute puppies, though. I like <laughs> I like that ad. <laughs> <laughs> I liked your response to uh, to that uh, uh, in the article that you wrote on beerandwinejournal.com. So uh, those who haven't read it uh, should go and, and read that. You, you had some fun. It was very cleverly written, I thought. Thanks. Yeah, a little, a little bit of sarcasm may have slipped into it. <laughs> Just a little from you. <laughs> I know, hard to believe. Well, we are. We're talking about. I, I got an email the other day from uh, listener Dave. Uh, said, uh, ma- like many home brewers, I've gone from kit to extract to all grain, three vessel to brew in a bag, and now I seem to be back to partial mash, a true partial mash with an actual mash, uh, as opposed to steeping, I guess. I just can't tell a difference in the finished product. It's so much easier, less equipment, water to cool. Uh, but he had a question. What I can't find are websites or forums truly dedicated to partial mash. And he was asking if I knew of any. And I don't know that if, of a resource that is uh, definitely just uh, concentrating on partial mashing. You are a fan of, of partial mashing. Uh, and a lot of people disparage it. A lot of people say that... Uh, if you're going to take the time to, to mash some grain, uh, why not just mash enough grain to do a full size volume of beer? So uh, explain yourself, Chris Colby. What, what, uh, what is it about partial? What, first of all, what is partial mashing? Bring us back up to speed. It's been years since we've talked about it. But what is partial mashing and why are you a fan? Yeah, partial mashing is just a... Um, you can look at it as sort of an in-between step between, uh, you know, using malt extract and steeping some specialty grains and all grain brewing where all of your uh, fermentables come from, uh, you know, uh, mashing malted grains. Um, and so what a partial mash is, is you have, uh, you, you make a small mash, smaller than you would need to, to make all your wort. Uh, you make some wort from that partial mash and then you just... Uh, accent it with malt extract. You just use, you know, malt extract to bring it up to your final uh, gravity. And yeah, a lot of people will say, you know, why bother that? If you're going to go, you know, if you're going to make a small mash, why not just make, you know, a larger mash and be done with it? Um, And, you know, one thing I would say is that some people don't have the equipment for it. You know, a lot of people uh, have, have a five gallon extract brewing set up. And, you know, they might, uh, they might be interested in all grain brewing. And I think making some partial mash beers is an excellent way to sort of, uh, give that a try. See if it, uh, see if the mashing part is something you might enjoy before committing yourself to buying a mash ton and a, and a propane, uh, you know, uh, propane burner and potentially a, a wort chiller and all that. So one reason is, uh, you know, one reason to try it is as a step to all grain brewing. Um, another reason is just the versatility of it. You can brew a wider variety of batches, uh, a wider variety of different kinds of beers uh, using partial mash than you can with just plain extract and steeping methods. And so uh, opens up some horizons there. And, and also some people just, you know, uh, maybe they live in an apartment, they, you know, or maybe for whatever reason, they just aren't going to move up to ha- having a full brewing rig and brewing full all-grain beers. And this is a great way to incorporate uh, base grains into your beer. It's a great way to incorporate uh, you know, a, a beer with a partial mash formulation. If you could compare it to one brewed with extracts and steeping grains only, the partial mash one is going to have a little bit more of the aroma of the base grains in it. And so, I mean, I think of it as... Really, it's not that much more complicated than brewing with an extract versus grain formulation. It's uh, 
you know, very slightly uh, more difficult and usually not, it doesn't take that much longer. I mean, cause the steeping times that a lot of the recipes call for are, are on par with the, you know, the mashing times. And it's just, you know, it's just nice for flexibility. It's nice if you're an apartment brewer, it's nice. Um, I mean, I've got a full fancy schmancy outside brewing rig, but when it's, you know, it's in Texas and, during the middle of the summer when it's 115 degrees and under my carport, you know, if I have a choice between brewing outside or brewing in my kitchen, you know, while I listen to music and watch TV or something, I'm going to choose that, you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, I imagine people in, you know, Minnesota right now are probably thinking, you know, <laughs> uh, they're not going to want a real, uh, you know, roll their rigs out into the, you know, four feet of snow and, and at very cold temperatures when they could brew in their kitchen. So that's a, that's another reason for partial mashing is you you get almost all the flexibility of all grain brewing, but you can do it in your kitchen. So how are you getting away with uh, with smaller volumes to boil or how you how are you get, getting away with the smaller amounts of equipment are you doing uh, a partial boil and topping up with water in the fermenter? Yeah. Yeah, do it exactly like the extract with grains. I mean, what I'll typically do is make the partial mash wort and this will be uh it sort of depends on I, I do either uh or do a couple different sizes of, of partial mashes but um between two and three gallons usually of wort collected straight from the uh from the mash then i'll add maybe half the, the malt extract required uh boil that as a concentrated uh boil you know like bring uh you know exactly like brewing a an extract beer and then at knockout, I'll add the rest, stir in the rest of the malt extract, you know, maybe let that steep for a minute, and then cool down the wort, rack it to the fermenter, and add water to uh, top it up. Why wouldn't you add all the extract all at the beginning? Uh, just for the basic, same basic reason you would do that in an extract late beer. You don't need to boil uh, the malt extract. Uh, you know, it's already been boiled if it's brewery grade malt extract. And uh, boiling it all when the uh, in, in a very concentrated manner it darkens the wort a little bit more, and it, it also potentially has a negative impact on your hop utilization. So basically, just for a lighter colored beer, just stir in the, the extract or you know the bulk of it later. So nowadays, uh, you say that uh, using um, using a, a base malt, uh, like for instance uh, a Munich or a Pilsner, or something like that can bring some extra malty flavors to, say, you know, just using a just a light, light dry malt extract or a light uh, liquid malt extract. There are Pilsner and Munich uh, uh, malt extracts out there. So does that negate the, the uh, need for partial mashing in those? Uh, no, it's, it's nice now that there are, uh, you know, Pilsner malt extracts, uh, Munich malt extracts. I think uh, I've even seen a, a Vienna malt extract. Uh, so the fact that these are available in malt extract form and they used to not be uh, doesn't mean that there's there's no reason to partial mash anymore. Because um, although you can get them in malt extract form, uh, actually doing a mash of them is going to result in a more aromatic uh, wort and beer. Yeah, I, the only time that I've I don't have the Usually when I do extract brews, I do a light dry malt extract and and accentuate it with uh, uh, specialty grains of this, that, and the other. Uh, but I did buy a kit uh, from a large uh, retailer uh, that had a couple of jugs of the Munich malt extract, I believe. And it was a double IPA recipe. And at the end of it, it, it still tasted like an extract beer, I got to say. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of big and... Thick and extracty, and uh, so I wasn't. I was, dis, uh, you know, kind of disappointed. Uh, so I'm just wondering if uh, if I had su substituted uh, some uh, Munich malt and I did a partial mash. Uh, wondering, you know, if that would have uh, upped the quality of that of that that brew. I think it would have for a couple of reasons, especially if it's a double IPA. One is that. When, when they manufacture the malt extract and they, you know, they they start out sort of exactly like you would when you're brewing a beer. They, 
you know, they mash the grains, they run it off, they, they boil it. Um, but then in the, in the condensation process, some of the, uh, not all, but some of the uh, aromatic compounds, which are volatile, which is why they're aroma compounds, you know, get, get lost. They get blown off on the columns that they're uh, condensed on. So, uh, you know, if you make two works, one just from reconstituting malt extract and the other that's, you know, run off an all-grain mash, the, the one run off the all-grain mash is going to be uh, a little bit more aromatic. And so, uh, likewise, using just, you know, even – even a fairly small amount, just a one to two pounds of the of the base malt that you selected is going to bring uh, the the aromatics uh, from from that base malt to your beer. And secondarily, if you were to compare two worts, one made uh, from reconstituting malt extract and one made from uh, you know mashing and you know and using all grain procedures, the fermentability of the all grain wort is going to be uh, is typically a little uh, more. It, it, um, if you're trying to make a dry beer, malt extract, uh, for reasons I'm not 100% sure, is usually not quite as fermentable as an all-grain wort. And so if you're trying to brew, especially if you're trying to brew something like a double IPA where you really want uh, to cut down on the, any residual sweetness, uh, going to a partial mash formulation uh, from an extract one is going to lower your final gravity because the, the, the wort you make will, will be more fermentable. And you could even use the uh, the wort that you made uh, from scratch, from, from the grains, to alter the fermentability of the extract uh, wort. You can steep, essentially stir in some of the, the extract into the all-grain wort, let it sit at mashing temperature for a couple minutes, and that will go to work on uh, some of the... Uh, uh, larger carbohydrates in the uh, extract work. So you can actually change the fermentability of the extract uh, after it's after it's in the water. Right. Exactly. And w- there's a recipe where you demonstrate that uh, that we can talk about here in a couple of minutes. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, for uh, f- there are reasons why an extract brewer would want to add all grain components to their beer. There is also uh, a reason why all grain brewers would want to add extract into their recipe as well. If they are, uh, if they're brewing a big, a high gravity beer, uh, instead of spending a lot of time uh, collecting uh, wort from from a lot of grain in the mash tun and boiling that down, if they want to save time and fuel, uh, they can add some extract to boost the uh, the gravity of a big beer that they're brewing, right? Right, yeah. If you're brewing, uh, uh, say, five gallons of barley wine, and you're normally an all grain brewer, um, you would have a couple ways that you could approach that. One way would be to, uh, you know, mash the grains and just you know completely sparge them until uh, they're you know uh, there's no sugars left in them, but you're not rinsing out the tannins yet. And then you'd have a large volume of wort, much more than your your target batch size, and you'd have to boil it down for a, for a long time. Uh, another way to do it would be just to put as much, you know, almost as much grain as your mash tun would hold and collect, uh, you know, as much wort as you were going to, but just collect the higher gravity wort. And um, then you'd have less boil time, but you would be leaving a lot of sugars behind in the mash tun. And, you know, like you say, the other way to do it is make a, you know, mash the grains get collect a uh, pre-boil volume you know that you're comfortable with for for uh what your boil time is going to be and what your kettle size is and then just make up any deficit in uh, specific gravity with with malt extract and that would be yeah that would be a partial mash so let's talk uh, technique and some details uh on the very very basic level what's the difference between true mashing and steeping specialty grains? Well, when you steep specialty grains, uh, for example, most, uh, if you're brewing as a standard English ale recipe using normal extract methods, a lot of times, you know, the recipe will call for steeping crystal malt and you'll, you know, you'll, you'll crush the, the crystal malt, put it in a bag, stick it in the, uh, your brew pot at, at whatever temperature the recipe calls for. And what, what's happening in the, in the steeping process is, 
that the water is simply dissolving whatever is present uh, in, in the specialty grain. Uh, for example, there's in the middle of a in the inside the kernel of crystal malt, there's actually sugars, and on the outside, there's uh, you know husk compounds that have uh, been developed during roasting. So you get the, the color comes off of the husk, and the uh, the sugar dissolves, and so steeping is uh, simply a process of dissolving whatever it is in the uh, in the grains into your wort. Um, in mashing, the difference is is that the interior of, of grains that are mashed are uh, are made of starch, not sugars. They haven't been the the malting process has gone differently for them, and so they've remained having uh, starch into it. <clears throat> they've remained having starch in their interior rather than having it converted um, into sugar. So in mashing, uh, you not only dissolve the starch into solution, but then uh, other um, enzymes that are in the, the grain also then convert that starch into sugars. So in the, the practical upshot is that you can steep at – pretty much any temperature you want and then pretty much any thickness uh your you know or water to grain ratio you want there's i mean there's some practical limits that you don't want to but you know for it, it within reason you don't have to worry about your temperature or how much water you have to your grain volume in mashing the, the uh the variables are a little bit tighter you need to be you pretty much need to be uh quote unquote steeping your grains uh, between 148 and 162 degrees Fahrenheit, or sometimes people use one 150 to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. But, you know, but somewhere you need to be steeping somewhere. Steeping in quotes there when you mash. Uh, <laughs> uh, you need to be soaking the grains in water in that relatively narrow range, uh, and you need the. Uh, the mash thickness or, or, you know, the amount of liquid per grain to be within a certain, uh, certain region, you know, you want uh, at a minimum, the, it's got to be like a liquid slurry. You can't, if, if you don't have enough water and it's actually like, you know, sort of oatmeal and, and, and it's still a solid, that's not enough water. And then if you add way too much water, that's too soupy, that's, that's again causes problems. So there's gotta be, there's, um, you know, a specific uh, window of liquid to grain that you have to hit, which it's not that hard really to do it, but but it is a little bit constrained with regards to uh, or compared to, to steeping. And then, of course, you do, um, in the case of mashing versus steeping, uh, the activity of the enzymes on, on the starch takes a while, so it requires, uh, you know, it requires you to mash as long as, you know, uh, there's still starch present and with steeping, you can just sort of, you can steep for almost any length of time. As long as once you've got, you know, uh, once you, once you think you've got everything dissolved, uh, you know, you can, you can move on to the next step. And you talk about it. it what I did was I went to, uh, beer and wine journal.com and I searched in the search field for partial mash and a bunch of articles came up, including a bunch of uh, recipes, uh, but uh, you ca- you talk about two different methods of partial mashing. You have uh, a countertop uh, partial mashing, and then you have uh, one that uses a colander, which is kind of a more of a basic uh, basic method. Talk about those two. Con- compare and contrast those two methods. Yeah, the the first one where you uh, you mash uh, the grains. Um, I forget I called it something clever like brew pot mashing with colander loudering or something, <laughs> something, something that just trips off the tongue. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, yeah, in that case, you, you, when you quote unquote steep the grains, which is actually in this case mashing, um, it's very similar, you know, pretty much identical to steeping specialty grains in that you've got them in a, uh, a nylon bag or a muslin bag or whatever, where we use to steep grains in, uh, sitting in the brew pot. Um, the only difference is the, you know, in the recipes, the amount of water is specified and the temperature is specified. And so you, uh, quote unquote, steep the grains uh, in your brew pot like that. You, you know, you 
stir every once in a while, maybe add some heat if you need to. Uh, and, you know, generally mash those, those grains in there for an hour. And then um, in all grain brewing, once you're done, you run the word off from the, uh, from the grains and then you sparge the grains with hot water to rinse out the remaining uh, sugars. And uh, in this method, you sort of, in some ways, reverse that in that you just pull the grains out of the, the wort and let the wort sit there. But then you, you stick the, uh, the grain bag in a colander, set that over the top of the, uh, the brew pot, and just sort of trickle warm water over the, uh, over the grain bag and let that, uh, let that filter through and rinse the rest of the, uh, rest of the sugars from the grain, uh, into, into your brew pot. And so at that point, your brew pot is full of, uh, all grain wort. And, you know, uh, if you follow any of the recipes on our site, which we've got quite a few, uh, that you're going to, it's going to be probably between two and three gallons of all grain wort. And at that point, uh, depending on the recipe, you may or may not stir in some malt extract, you know, start to boil, add the hops or whatever. And then, you know, basically from that point on, it's, it's the finishing it up is exactly like you would an extract brew. And for countertop partial mashing, this is a little bit closer in, uh, setup to, uh, you know, regular brewing in that what I do is I just take a, uh, one of those round like uh, beverage coolers that have a spigot on it, you know, like people, uh, you know, like the type that uh, the, the orange ones that, that have Gatorade uh, mm-hmm. on the side of football games. Uh, and anyway, they, they come in two gallon sizes, three gallon sizes, five gallon sizes. And for partial mashing, both the two and three gallon sizes are, are really nice. You can get uh, four and six pounds respectively of grain into one of those, which is enough to, to supply a decent amount of the uh, for fermentables to your beer. And anyway, to do that, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can uh, mash in your brew pot as before, then put the uh, put the grain bag into the, the picnic cooler, pour the wort from your brew pot into the, into the cooler, and then uh, just draw out the wort, let it, let the wort run through the grain bed, which will clarify it, which in the, in the other, uh, in the other method, you don't get that. And then you can uh, add sparge water once you're done running your wort through the grain bed and just uh, run it off just, just by opening the spigot. You don't even need to modify the cooler in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that way works well. Uh, I think you get a little bit better efficiency because of the way um, you the, the, the grain bed is uh, rinsed. It's also less uh, messy. Because when you're done, all your grains are sitting there in, inside a, a cooler, and you can just uh, set that aside until you until you're done, uh, you know, done with your boil or whatever, and go dispose of them once they've cooled down. Um, in the other method, you've got a colander with with the grains in it, and they're gonna it's gonna sit there, and uh, you know, uh, just be dripping on onto whatever. I mean, you'll you'll probably put like a cookie sheet around it or something, but you know, it's just the Countertop marsh, partial mashing is a little bit has it has a couple advantages I think and and one of them is easier cleanup. Now I, I have a a colander that is uh, made out of mesh, kind of wire mesh, and the the holes in it are so small that uh, I don't even need to use a grain bag. You know, essentially you can just do brew in a bag on the stovetop. You know, and do a partial mash, uh, which is kind of what what the first uh, technique is is like. Uh, but I've discovered that I can just let the the grains be loose, you know, in my kettle, uh, and then scoop those out using a big uh, scooper that I've I found at the um, uh, at the discount store, and I scoop that into the uh, uh, into the mesh colander, and then I'm able to sparge some hot water over the top of that uh, without needing a bag. Um, so those are out there if you can find them. Also, if you want to maintain the temperature of your mash. Uh, in your kettle, if your if your brew pot or whatever vessel that you're mashing in is small enough, you can set your oven temperature uh, to your mash temperature and put that in your oven, and that will maintain uh, your mash temperature perfectly, and you don't have to worry about adding heat at all. So there's two two handy tips from the uh, Spencer kitchen there. 
Yeah, oven mashing is, is another oven partial mashing is another method that people have used. I uh, when I was over in Europe, I even saw they had this uh, uh, sort of automated homebrew machine that had uh, a, a kettle or brew pot essentially with a with a metal uh, insert into it, uh, very much like a colander, and the the beer was mashed in that vessel. Then the the colander just moved up, letting the uh, letting the wort drip out, and it was boiled in that that same vessel. So it was sort of like a like an automated brew in a bag. Yeah, I think that's uh, the. I think you're referring to the sh- the Speidel Braumeister. Uh, I think so. Yeah, we saw a couple of those uh, in a in a large size at a Bike Rack Brewing. Uh, on uh, was it the most recent show? I don't know. Uh, I lose track. <laughs> We've I've done more than more than 450 audio episodes. They all run together. Um, so, so the you know you, as long as you can find a vessel to uh, to maintain the the proper temperature at the proper volume, you know you can do a, a mash, and then you know you figure out your way to separate the wort from the grain and uh, start it boiling and, and get your extract in there. Uh, the uh, the tricky part may be converting uh, an extract recipe to a partial mash recipe because then, you know, a pound of extract uh, is not the same. A pound of dry extract is not the same as a pound of liquid extract, and that's not the same as the pound of, uh, of base malt. So how the heck do you figure out how how much of which to substitute, you know, how much uh, – grain do you have to substitute for dry and how much do you have to substitute for liquid it's all confusing right there's a little bit of math involved because oh my gosh as you as you mentioned um if you if you took a pound of say dried malt extract and uh dissolved it in a gallon of water you'd get a specific gravity about 1.045 if you took a pound of liquid malt extract this time in dissolve that in a gallon of water, you'd be probably closer to 1.037 or something like that. So there's more, because there's less water in dried malt extract, there's more uh, sugar. Yeah, there's more more, uh, more, (laughs) yeah, more stuff contributing to the uh, uh, specific gravity of the beer, which, sort of confusingly enough, brewers called extract, even though it's uh, (laughs) you know what I'm saying. And, And so with base malts, you have the added uh, the added twist that you know there's a certain amount of sugar you can get out of them, but it's also dependent on your technique how much you do get out of them, and that's called extract efficiency. And so anyway, there there's you, you got to go through the math, and the easiest way to do that is simply to do it on. I think most people these days have have or have access to. I mean, certainly if you have a computer and you're listening to a podcast, you have access to recipe formulation software. Um, you know, there are different sites online, but a lot of people also have, you know, any of the, any of the commercial packages that uh, take, you know, a list of recipes and give you the, uh, you know, original gravity uh, IBUs and all that. And, and the easiest way to, to, to take an extract recipe and make it into a, a all grain recipe is you first just decide to add Leave the uh, leave the amount of specialty grains the same. Like let's say, let's say you're making a pale ale, and the recipe is, you know, you had your malt extract, and uh, basically 10 percent of the way of the recipe was crystal malt. Okay, just, we'll use a simple example. Uh, so what you do is you would retain the amount of crystal malt you did, but then you would add an appropriate base malt to the to the recipe. Maybe. And, you know, it's as little as a couple pounds in a five-gallon batch is enough to get the uh, aromatic uh, compounds from the, from the base malt into your beer. And, and with more, you get you get added benefits of being able to control ferm- fermentability and stuff. But just, just a couple pounds uh, can make all the difference. And also just adding a couple pounds to a typical uh, sort of extract base steep is, is very manageable. So anyway, you add a, add a couple pounds to the appropriate base malt. And if, if you don't know what the the appropriate base malt is for that kind of beer, you can probably just look at all grain examples of the beer, and and you know you'll you'll quickly see which ones are are being used. For example, if you're brewing a sort of English style pale ale, 
then something like, you know, uh, English pale ale malt would be what you want as your base malt. If you were using, uh, you know, if you were brewing a, say, a German lager, then Pilsner malt might be the uh, appropriate base malt. So so now you've got the, you know, the specialty malts that you retained from before, and you've added some uh, base malt to, to your formulation. If you were to go ahead and brew with that, you would be over your target gravity because you've added something to it. So what you need to do is subtract out the uh, the appropriate amount of malt extract to get back down to your target original gravity. And if you're using uh, if you're using the recipe formulation software, you can just do that by trial and error. Just you know, if if you've got 11 pounds of malt extract, say in the original recipe, and and you know you have a certain you're hitting a uh, gravity of I, I don't know I'm making this up off the top of my head. <laughs> the, let's say they was sixty five ten sixty five, and when you reformulate it with some added grains, it, it's higher than that. Just you know, try ten pounds, and if you get down to where you want, you know, or if you don't get down, or try nine pounds, you know, just just start subtracting until you you know until you dip below that, and then just add back a little bit. But so you know, by trial and error, it, it's the it's the easiest way to do it. You can. You can do it arithmetically if you, you know, if you remember your junior high uh, algebra and then like to, but. Um, <laughs> but if you're a modern person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you say in the in the uh, in the article entitled uh, or titled, not entitled, uh, add base malts to your extract beers. Uh, you say how to do it, basically. Uh, yeah. You say multiply the weight of – if you use dried malt extract, multiply the weight of the base malt that you added to the recipe by 0.53, and that's the amount of extract that you need to uh, to subtract. And if you use liquid malt extract, multiply the weight of the base malt that you're adding by 0.65, and that's the amount of extract that you need to uh, – to uh, subtract so and then you follow with an example so it's i mean it's not impossible to do it on pen and you know with pen and paper uh, <laughs> it's just easier to do with uh, with software as usual um so let's let's take a look at uh, at some of the recipes that you have and kind of use them as an example of why you would want to uh you know why would why you would want to use partial mash uh, instead of doing a full extract uh, beer, for instance, uh, your your fortified winter warmer, uh, and talk about take a, take a moment, find that recipe. <laughs> if you're playing along at home or at work, uh, and you're next to a computer, you can do this as well. But search for a fortified winter warmer. Uh, talk about uh, this recipe and why. Uh, partial mashing uh, is useful in this this one. Okay, yeah. In this one, what I've done is it's a big beer. And so, uh, and this is actually, a, the recipe is for a three-gallon partial mash beer. And the idea is that uh, you could go all grain and collect three gallons of it, but if you're using a sort of stovetop, uh, you know, a typical five-gallon extract setup, uh, you would still need uh, sort of extra equipment to, to make that big of a mash. So, but with with the simple uh, countertop partial mash, you can make uh, a decent amount of wort and then just uh, oh, what's the word? Supplement. <laughs> 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 Augment. Augment. Yeah, you can supplement the wort with uh, malt extract to get it to the higher. Uh, the higher original gravity because the original gravity on this one is let me look uh 1085 so that's pretty big beer you mm. know eight ish uh the, the beer itself is is eight abv and then when you add the uh the aqua v to it you you boost it to nine yeah for example i did a, a um a scotch ale and i i collected i believe four gallons of wort and then i boil it down to two uh, and I, that's the the you know initial gravity that I that I got. So you know rather than but that took me two hours to boil the wort down to that 
initial that original gravity that you're looking for in that recipe. So, um, you know, if you want to save time and energy, again, add some extract to that uh, to that recipe, and it's it's a bit of a way to cheat a little bit. Um, right, right. When you're making a very big beer, you've either got to spend time and energy boiling down a lot of wort. You've either got to spend money on more grain or you've got to spend money on malt extract. It's just, you know, you just pick which one mm-hmm. you want to do. And then the Russian Imperial Stout recipe. And this is a recipe that you're using the enzymes from the mash to affect the characteristics of the extract. Yeah, in this one, this is a, a regular five-gallon uh, partial mash. Uh, and this one... Uh, the, the original gravity is 1095, so that that's the reason for the partial mash there is that you do uh, – um, you collect enough of your wort from a, a partial mash and then augment it with malt extract, and, and the, although you're still brewing in your, in your kitchen, so you don't need a, a huge kettle volume. And yeah, um, on this beer, you want the final gravity – you don't want it to be super low, uh, but it, it's going to be big enough already that – the added sort of lack of fermentability of extract could wind up leaving you a sort of overly sickly sweet beer. And so what I do in this is you, you collect the, uh, you collect the, the wort from the all grain uh, mash or, or, you know, the, the partial mash. Yeah. And so you hold it, uh, the dissolved malt extract, you know, dissolved into the, uh, into the, the regular wort, uh, any, uh, larger carbohydrates that can be acted on by the uh, enzymes in the uh, in the wort will you know raise the fermentability uh, of your wort and therefore let you reach a lower uh, lower uh, finishing gravity, which is frequently helpful on when you're trying to brew a big beer using malt extract. But you do, it's not only big beers that you recommend doing partial mashes with. Uh, for instance, uh, the Ordinary Bitter, uh, which is uh, is typically a, a session beer. You have uh, you su- you suggest that we do a a partial mash recipe for that. Yeah, uh, I mean, a partial mash formulation is going to help you. Uh, I th- I think basically any extract recipe, or, or almost any. Uh, I'll leave myself a small opening. Almost any <laughs> recipe can be improved by adding base grains to it and making it a partial mash. You just the, the aroma is better. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to um, adjust the uh, fermentability uh, a little more. Uh, you have you have more opportunity to do that in a partial mash beer versus an extract and steeping grains beer. And so yeah, it, it, it it's not just for big beers. Uh, and the nice thing about a ordinary bitter recipe, okay, a very low gravity um, one, is that when you make it with a partial mash method, uh, it's almost entirely, uh, it's almost like an all grain beer with just a tiny amount of extract needed. Like in this one, there's only one pound, 14 ounces of light dried malt extract in it. The rest comes from the uh, the mash, which let me see what size of the mash this is. Okay, uh, this uses a two uh, the two gallon cooler. So you you mash four pounds of grain, and then you use only uh, just short of two pounds of malt extract uh, because it's such a low gravity beer. And so in, in that case, you've you've almost made a, an all grain beer on your stovetop with equipment and techniques. Uh, you know, e- either very similar to what you do with extract on steeping grains, or if you use the actual uh, countertop partial mass mash methods, uh, you know, something that's simple and you can still do in your kitchen and you don't need, uh, you don't need to buy a larger kettle. You don't need to buy a mash ton. You don't need, uh, you know, you don't need to, to step up your scale to, uh, what a full five gallon all grain, uh, brewing setup would entail. Well, the upshot of this whole conversation is that now I'm thirsty and it's, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. So, <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere though right yeah 
<laughs> well, I I, would, go ahead. I would just say as like a, it's like a wrap up to this whole talk on partial mash is that um, partial mashing is just an option that you have. And, you know, I, I, I'm personally a big fan of it. I, uh, you know, I started doing extract with steeping grains recipes, like almost everyone in, in, you know, who started at the time I did. And, you know, I eventually graduated to all grain brewing and, and the bulk of my brewing is just straight all grain brewing. But I like partial mash beers because I can brew them inside, uh, in my kitchen when the, when the weather is, uh, not hospitable. Um, I can brew them. It's a little bit, it's shorter than an all grain brew day generally, just cause you're heating, cooling smaller volumes of, uh, liquid. Uh, and the, the quality of the beers you get is, you know, if you're using fresh malt extract and fresh ingredients and you, you know, your skill does a brewer, you, you can't really tell the difference between, uh, an all grain beer and a partial mash beer. It's, it's, it's harder to peg a beer as a partial mash beer, way harder than it is than, than identifying one that's been made entirely from extract. So it's just, uh, one, uh, one option brewers have. And I, I think it's one that brewers are going to be, I think it's going to become increasingly popular is what I'm saying. I think, especially for, uh, people just converting some of their extract recipes up to a partial mash formulation just because it's so, it's so easy. And then the benefits are, uh, you know, are going to be noticeable the very first time you do it. So there you go. Buy stock in partial mashing. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. No, I, I'm all for I'm all for keeping as many tools in the toolkit as possible. Uh, so you know, I'm not going to turn up my nose. Well, I might turn up my nose to some brewing techniques, but uh, <laughs> but you know, everything. The more that you know about different brewing techniques. Uh, the more likely you are to use them, and uh, and you might come up with a new use. Who knows? And you might, you know, uh, like I said, I think one of the the best applications for this is for for people who brew in their apartment, because you you can essentially brew beers uh, uh, that are as good as uh, uh, all grain you know, five gallon batches, but you can brew it with the sort of equipment you would use to make five gallon extract batches. Cause I mean, I lived in a, an apartment in Boston for, uh, 10 years or so. And, uh, when I moved up to all grain, it was just a fiasco because <laughs> it was, I just, I mean, essentially my whole kitchen was taken over with brewing equipment and it was very cramped and it, you know, it was just less than ideal. And, uh, had I thought of this, <laughs> Beforehand, it would have been a lot easier, and the beers would have been great. And uh, yeah, so there you go. There you have it. All right, thanks, Chris. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, thanks again to Chris. It uh, may be time to to play around with partial mashing again. Steve and I did a partial mash uh, to uh, improve uh, a Mister Beer recipe. You can find that on YouTube. And uh, also in our, our basic brewing video feed. It's a quite popular video. Uh, by the way, listener Dave, who shared the original email that sparked this conversation, has a spreadsheet for uh, putting together partial mash recipes. So if you're interested in checking that out, drop me a line and uh, I will get you guys together. He'd probably uh, appreciate some feedback on his partial mashing spreadsheet. So, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com, or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link, where you can throw a couple of pucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site check out our basic brewing shirts in the store as well. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com and if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week, their purchased through the link are Dockers Men's 9-Piece Hanky Gift Set. White one size. And Bum Genius 
Elemental All-in-One Diaper. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is brought by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.